I'm now joined by Ken Chenault and Ken Frazier, two men who each spent more than a decade as CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, Ken Chenault and American Express, and Ken Frazier at Merck. This past spring, it was these two individuals who led the movement for the business community to speak out on voting rights. Following their call to action and a letter signed by more than 70 black business leaders, corporate America changed their stance. Delta and Coca-Cola reversed their positions on the Georgia voting law, calling it unacceptable and wrong. And Major League Baseball relocated its summer all-star game from Georgia to Colorado. More than 100 corporations spoke out to defend voting rights. And it sparked a debate in this country that continues as Texas becomes the latest state to sign new, new voting restrictions into law. Meanwhile, the picture of diversity in corporate America today is also bleak. Only four African-American CEOs in the Fortune 500. We're going to talk about all of this and where we go today and how to move forward in Washington, at the state level, and in the boardroom. We want to welcome Ken Chenault and Ken Frazier. Good afternoon to the Kens. Good to see you, it's Andrew. Great to see you both. Thanks for being here. Uh, we've been together in person at this event many times before, and I appreciate you being here virtually with us on what was an extraordinary year uh, for both of you and an extraordinary year for this country. But I'm hoping that you can help us today try to understand the lessons of the experience you went through and some of the decision-making processes around it. Um, what was so unique about this year was you effectively not only called for corporations to take a stand on this issue, but in many ways called out your peers, oftentimes white peers in this case. I wanted to ask you if you'd sort of take us inside the room on how this all happened, Ken. I think, Andrew, what was very important here is that Ken and I and others felt that voting rights is really fundamental to our democracy. And that our democracy, if you will, was under attack. Because of the issues, historical issues around voting for blacks in America, and the fact that people died trying to get the right to vote, we did something that had never happened before in corporate America, and that was having black leadership in corporate America come together on this issue, which was not a partisan issue. What I also think was very important was that our colleagues, many of them white, decided to join us because I think there was an understanding that corporate America needed to stand up for our democracy. So I would just add that, you know, I think as Ken just said, voting is a fundamental right. I take a step back. You know, all of our colleagues believe strongly in the importance of the free enterprise system. Our companies are based on investments that we're able to make uh, because we live in a country where we do have free enterprise. But free enterprise is a close cousin of democracy. Uh, if you don't have a democratic government, and you can look around the world, you'll see no examples of places essentially that don't have democratic governments where you really do have a free enterprise system. And the core to that is equal participation in that system, equal access to that system. So in the spring, I think when the Georgia law was passed, a number of people were concerned, and we got calls from people in Georgia, calls from people in the African-American community. And the reason why this was important in the African-American community, let me take a step back, is that many of these provisions could be viewed on their face as neutral, um, could be viewed as broadly applicable, but they actually had a disproportionate effect on people who lived in urban areas, where the lines were long in the election. And so I think for African-American business people like myself and Ken, we have a platform, an opportunity to speak, an opportunity to cause our colleagues to become maybe a little bit more aware of what was actually in that law and why that was that that law might affect not just African-Americans, but all employees uh, in a way. And so I think this is fundamental to our businesses. But take us inside the room, because I have to imagine 
that the decision to do this and the decision to call out your peers, as you said, the first time this has ever been done, was not an easy decision to make, Ken. I'm going to go with Ken C. now. Wait, what, what I would say, Andrew, is it was not a hard decision, frankly. Because back to the points that Ken and I have made, we saw these laws as being a fundamental assault on our democracy. And it came about very quickly. So literally, first it was four or five people saying, what could we do? We said, this is, this is an issue that we need to take a stand on. And I think what was important is it wasn't so much as calling out corporate America. It, it was one being very clear that this issue was so fundamental that we had CEOs actually calling us. What did you think of the, the CEOs who didn't sign on? Look, I think at the end of the day, um, the reasons we got were one, people saying this is a partisan issue. And our point from the beginning was this has nothing to do with partisanship. This is fundamental to what our country stands for. There were others who said this is too controversial. We are concerned that we will be attacked. And at the end of the day, our view was that this is an issue that people need to stand up. Let me ask you, though, about the role of CEOs today in being outspoken on these issues. Uh, there has been criticism, um, and you know about it. Uh, let me just read you something. This is from Marco Rubio, uh, who says the following. This he said about Delta after all of this. said, quote, far too many multinational corporations are too eager to make their voices heard on the woke issues of the day in the United States, but remain stunningly silent, or in Delta's case, complicit in real ongoing atrocities in countries like China. So you have this situation now where you have elected officials now criticizing public companies, and in some cases, thinking about creating laws uh, that would be less attractive to business as a result. I can't believe what Senator Rubio is really saying is, I don't care about the fundamental principles of our democracy. I mean, literally, if you read the letter, if someone is going to tell me that that is controversial and that companies should not take that position, I just think that's wrong. And the reality is, we can have partisan disagreements, but what we have to be aligned on as a country is what are the fundamental values and principles that we're going to stand for. And I don't think that we can be discouraged or should allow ourselves to be discouraged from standing up for core principles of this country. What's the value of having a seat at the table versus what's the value of publicly protesting on, a, on moral grounds or other grounds? And it is very hard, as you know, to do both. And the reason I ask is China is just one example of this. But almost in any case, um, it's very difficult to be publicly uh, declaring something on one end and uh, against somebody else and then still get a seat at the table. And in an environment where everybody wants transparency, it puts you in a tough spot. Companies, with respect to their businesses, generally take a position on policy and what's going to further their business interests. What we're saying is there are cases on social issues where companies need to take a position. And so I don't think it's an either or. I think what's critical is you've got to be guided by the mission of your company, the values of your company. When do you think is the time to speak out? But that should not 
prevent you from having a seat at the table. If I say that I believe people should have a fundamental right to vote, does that mean that I can't be at the table on a range of other issues? So I don't think it's either or. Guys, I want to pivot the conversation, if I could, uh, to race in America, but frankly, uh, race in corporate America. Uh, Both of you have had extraordinary success, but uh, the truth is uh, there are too few of you, uh, only four of you today uh, at the top of Fortune 500 companies. And I know we've been having this conversation together for so long, um, but I, I hate to say it, I thought about a year and a half ago we were about to make a shift and we were going to see a real shift. And I wonder whether you think that shift is upon us or not. Frankly, I'm not sure. What I would say is I have been heartened by the level of support we've received on 110 from corporate America. And I think people have been very sincere and very focused on that effort. But I do think that can there has tell, to tell be, everybody can tell the audience what 110 is just so everybody everybody knows. Yeah, so so 110 is an organization that Ken and I co-founded with Ginny Rometty, uh, Charles Phillips, Kevin Shearer to create a million jobs for black Americans in 10 years. And I think what's important about this is we have over 60 companies that have signed up for this. Ken Frazier and Jenny Rometty are the co-chairs. And Ken, it's probably appropriate for you just to talk a little bit about what's happened. Yeah. So um, this is a coalition of the willing here of approximately 60 companies. It's actually 60 CEOs who are interested in looking at their own um, internal job criteria. Uh, The simple fact of the matter is that as we look at our jobs in this group, approximately 90% of the jobs in our companies require a four-year degree. The reality of the world is that for Black Americans at age 26, only about 75% of them, uh, I should say only about 25% of them have a four-year degree. So the math doesn't work. So what we've been trying to do is ask ourselves, which of these jobs really require that four-year credential? And of course, many of them do, but many of them are frankly based on skills. And so we've been saying to companies, unless you're willing to look at this standard, again, this goes back to an example I used in the voting situation, on their face, the requirement of a four-year degree is racially neutral. Uh, But in reality, in applying, it has a disparate impact on African-Americans because of the lack of educational opportunity. So what we're saying to people is, let's try to figure out which jobs we can train people, upskill, reskill people, so that they can go into jobs that have family-sustaining wages. There is uh, some talk of what are called racial audits that are being proposed for the first time this year. What do you think of that? So... I think that the challenge that we have in diversity is not that we don't have best intentions or good intentions. I think we haven't taken intentional actions to ensure that our words and our rhetoric are actually um, addressed by the structural things in our company. I would simply say that at Merck, everything that we think is important, we, we actually audit and we actually actually monitor our progress in terms of numerical progress. So while I think everybody can agree that we don't want to set artificial numbers, quotas, for example, uh, I think it does make sense uh, for us to look very carefully at what's happening in our companies and whether we're making, in fact, progress. Because I have to say, you talked about four CEOs. If you go back 10, 15 years, there were more than four black CEOs in, in corporate America. So what do you think, by the way, the what do you think happened? That we've, Why do you think that happened? So, so every company has its own story. Uh, so I won't try to express what happened across 500 companies, but if you have 500 companies, you have four African-American CEOs, I think we can all agree that the progress we made would be dismal compared to the most pessimistic idea uh, 30 years ago. And I want to come back to what I think is the problem. I think people have good intentions, 
but they don't put in place kind of the structures that are necessary to ensure that we're interrupting the sort of unconscious bias that exists, not just in corporate America, but elsewhere. So the, the hardest thing to overcome is the status quo. So what do I mean by that? Inside our companies, we have social networks. We have processes. If we don't ask ourselves why these processes, why these social networks are constantly producing something other than diverse slates of people and diverse promotions, then I think we're going to continue to do the same thing and not get different outcomes. Both of you are now in the venture capital business uh, at General Catalyst. And one of the things that does strike me is actually uh, how little diversity there is within the venture world and how crucial that may very well be in terms of actually creating cultures from the very beginning that are diverse. What are you seeing in that? Yeah, I think one of the reasons, and I know it's also uh, a reason why Ken is very interested in, in venture, is one, technology, as we know, is an incredible enabler. What's important, though, is what's the purpose that we should be involved in? And, and one of the concepts we're focused on at General Catalyst is something we call responsible innovation. And one of the pillars of responsible innovation is diversity and inclusion. Clearly, to the point you made, Andrew, the record in venture is dismal, is not a good record. And one of the things that I'm very focused on, and I know Ken will be very focused on, is to improve diversity in venture and in technology overall. But one of the things we're trying to do is let's get it right from the beginning. Let's make sure we have processes, approaches, a mindset that will really drive diversity in our companies. And so that is a very high priority of General Catalyst. It's a very high priority for me, and I know it's a very high priority for Ken. When I was asked to join General Catalyst, that's what stood out to me, was this concept that we were just talking about in, the, in diversity uh, around intentionality. So if you're thinking, let's try to build companies from the very beginning for growth as well as social good, you know, avoiding all the unintended consequences that have occurred elsewhere in our country, um, creating more opportunity, creating more access for people, then that's something that I'm very interested in. You know, we, we talk about diversity. I like the word opportunity uh, because I think that's what we're really talking about is are we providing opportunity to people irrespective of where they come from in our society or are we using criteria that unintentionally screen out people who may have the talent to contribute to our society? I have to ask you about this great news about this Merck Therapeutic. Um, and what you think it means uh, for the trajectory of uh, this pandemic, which I hope we're on the, the other side of or getting, getting closer to. So I think we're very excited to bring to market the first oral antiviral pill for COVID-19. We think it could be a very important uh, contributor uh, in a society like ours where we have access to vaccines. Vaccines should be the first line of defense but we also know we have seven and a half billion people on the planet. And in order for us to overcome a global pandemic, we're going to have to have the kinds of medicines that are easily accessible. So because this is an oral medicine, it can be used all over the world. All you need is drinking water to use with these pills. Uh, what we've done, as you may know, Andrew, is we've agreed to make these, this medicine available to all the low income and low middle income countries free of charge. We think that that can get to many people. And the importance here is if we don't actually treat people in those countries, we have a better chance of creating more variants and more mutations. So we're very excited that this pill could make a big difference around the world. Is your sense, just so, just so I, I, I understand it though, that um, we are on the other side of this now? I think that to quote Winston Churchill, we're certainly at the end of the beginning. I think that this is going to be 
a virus that we're going to live with for an awful long time. It won't always be a pandemic. It will be endemic at some stage. And we're going to need new medicines, just like we do in HIV. The great thing right. with HIV, remember, that used to be a death sentence. Now, with HIV, newly diagnosed HIV patients have the same life expectancy as people who don't have HIV because we have good medicines. And that's what we're aiming for here is to be able to make sure that if you do get infected, that you don't necessarily get very, very ill or die. Right. Um, by the way, before I, before I let you go, what do you think of the issue of vaccine hesitancy, especially among the African-American community? So I think it's very unfortunate. I think there's a lot of misinformation. Of course, in the African-American community, there's a lot of mistrust going back to things like the Tuskegee experiments. And so it's very important for us to have role models in the community of people who are trusted. Uh, because right now, I think it's very unfortunate the amount of misinformation that's out there about vaccine uh, safety, uh, about the, the idea that the vaccine is actually gonna cause harm. And as you know, the, the sad thing is that life expectancy for African-Americans because of this pandemic has decreased by three years in just two years. So that's a huge issue compared to white Americans, it's actually declined by one year, but it's three times more for Hispanics uh, and African-Americans. So we have to overcome that fear of vaccines and it can only be done through trust, which gets back to what Ken was saying about general catalyst and the idea that we have to create new systems that provide access to people that have trust, that actually allow people to have access, not just when they get really sick, uh, because obviously when people get sick, they go to the hospital and they get on ventilators. We need to maintain the health of people. And as you know, this pandemic, we've seen the impact on mental health. We've seen the impact on substance abuse. So we're trying to create a system where we can maintain the health of all Americans. I want to end here, which is Ken Frazier just talked about role models, and it just so happens that you happen to be a role model for him and a mentor to him. I hope you'd share just a little bit about how you got to know each other and how you became his mentor. Well, Ken and I met at Harvard Law School. I was in my third year. Ken was in his first year. And, and we knew each other, but we weren't really good friends somewhat because of the difference in classes. But Ken then went on to a very distinguished career uh, practicing law. And then uh, Ray Vagelos uh, brought Ken to Merck. And when Ken, I believe it was, got his first line position, I called Ken and uh, said that I wanted to spend time with him. And Ken, you can take it from there. Well, I can say that the, the importance was that I had no real experience on the business side and to have someone, you know, like Ken Chenault, who was so effective in his job and so well respected. Uh, he tutored me about how I should think about business uh, from the from the customer side. But more importantly for me was how did I think about climbing that ladder inside Merck, aspiring to be a CEO, having the right relationship with my board, and, and so forth. So I have to say that I was extremely fortunate to have someone as skilled uh, and as accomplished as Ken Chenault translate to me how one becomes a business person, how one thinks about shareholders, employees, how one thinks about boards. And I have to say on my best day, in many ways, I'm imitating Ken Chenault. Now, I don't know about that, but what I would say um, clearly, Andrew, is that Ken was someone that I saw had the courage of his convictions, and he made some very tough calls at Merck, just as he made very tough calls in how he conducts his life when he pulled out of uh, the council he was on yep. uh, in Charlottesville. So uh, this is now very much of a peer-partner relationship. Ken Chenault, Ken Frazier. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having us.